Turn with me, if you would, to Acts. Acts chapter 7, we'll begin in verse 54 and go through chapter 8, verse 3. Today, we will be studying the stoning of Stephen. Last week, we worked through his sermon, and now we're going to be looking at his execution. He is the first Christian martyr. And this execution of Stephen sparked a great persecution against the church. There have been many great persecutions against the church over the centuries. The first major persecution from the Gentiles came during the reign of Nero. Um, In AD 64, there was a fire that broke out in Rome, and Nero blamed the Christians. Although we, we, we assume that he probably started the fire himself, he just needed a scapegoat in order to do his building project. But the persecution that the Christians endured in Rome was severe. He would clothe the Christians in animal skin and cast them to the dogs to be torn to pieces. He crucified some of the Christians. This is how Peter was killed during uh, this uh, time of persecution. He also cut off heads. We know that Paul was killed during this persecution, had his head cut off. But then others, Nero would light on fire to provide light for his dinner parties in his garden. In the early 2nd century, later on, under a different Roman emperor, uh, the early church father Ignatius was arrested and thrown to the wild beasts in Rome. Before his death, he wrote to some of the Christians in Rome uh, who sought to free him. He said, let me be fodder for the wild beasts. That is how I can get to God. I am God's wheat, and I am being ground by the teeth of wild beasts to make a pure loaf for Christ. And there are many other stories of Christian martyrs all throughout the centuries in different places and different times. And there are great persecutions that have happened all over the place. The seething hatred of the world for Christ often spills out onto his followers. But the persecution of Christians often does the opposite of what the persecutors seek to accomplish. It does not stifle Christianity, does not kill Christianity. It's more like rocket fuel to advance Christianity. This is what led to the famous quote that you are aware of by Tertullian, er another early church father, when he said, the blood of the martyrs is seed, meaning that the killing of Christians only creates more Christians, like the scattering of seed produces a crop. There are certainly thousands of Christ followers who have been put to death for their faith. There are many of those that we know their stories and cherish their stories, and there are countless names of Christians who have been martyred for their faith and their love of Christ that we don't know their names, and history has forgotten them. But you can be sure the Lord has not forgotten them. Of them all, Stephen was the first. So let's read of his execution, beginning in chapter 7, verse 54. Luke writes, Now when they had heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out, with a loud voice, and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. 
And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God who takes notice of the suffering of your saints. You are a God who, who preserves the truth of the gospel through much affliction and suffering. You are a God who saves sinners like Saul, sinners like us. And we are here this morning only because your grace has reached us. And Father, I pray if there's anyone in this room who's not believed the gospel, who's not believed upon the name of Jesus, that they would do so today. And Father, I pray that you would allow your word to bear fruit and that you would be glorified. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stephen had finished his sermon recounting the history of Israel. Israel had rejected the appointed leaders that God sent. And Joseph and Moses were prime examples of, of redeemers or deliverers that God sent for Israel, and they both faced rejection. Stephen placed the members of the Sanhedrin in the same category as those who rejected Joseph and Moses. They were now rejecting Jesus and also those who proclaimed Jesus as the resurrected Messiah. So he placed the Sanhedrin in a long line of Israelites who murdered the prophets that God sent. And like them, the Jewish leaders took part in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And like those who came before them, they are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, and they resist the Holy Spirit. Stephen spoke with great boldness, and upon hearing this bold sermon, the members of the Sanhedrin, Luke tells us, were enraged, and they ground their teeth. And then in verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice and shut their ears and rushed together at him. And they drug him out of the city and stoned him to death. Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit, but they were filled with rage. Stephen was at peace, but they were filled with anger. Stephen was affirmed by God, but they were turned over to their sin by God. Stephen was welcomed into heaven. But unless these men later repented in their lives, they were sentenced to eternal punishment. Stephen did not seek retribution, but sought their forgiveness. But they only wanted his death and the death of anyone who proclaimed the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke tells us that in their rage, they ground their teeth. They were gnashing their teeth in seething hatred and wrath towards Stephen. And this unbridled anger was not primarily directed at Stephen. It was directed at Christ himself, the Messiah, who came to bring salvation. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about the gnashing of teeth. In Psalm 35, verse 16, David says, His enemies gnash at him with their teeth. And then Psalm 37, 12 says the wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. Jesus describes hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, throughout my life, I've often assumed that the gnashing of teeth in hell was due to the severe pain of the eternal punishment. And there may be certainly some truth to that, but the word used here by Jesus to describe hell is the, from the same word group that's used in Acts 7. So it probably means more than just grinding teeth in pain. I think it means grinding teeth in anger. 
I think hell is going to be a place of unbridled anger. There will be zero common grace in hell. There will be nothing to hold back the full power of sin, even in light of its punishment. As people who have rejected Christ spend their eternity in unspeakable anguish and pain, their hearts will cry out against God in uncontrollable blind anger. The fires of hell will not produce repentance. It will drive men, it will not drive men and women towards a longing for Christ or for the salvation that he offers. People will be completely turned over to sin and their hearts will be filled with hate and anger towards the one who cast them into the fires of hell. We see a glimpse of this in the book of Revelation. As God pours out his wrath on unbelievers, John tells us they do not repent. They do not give him glory. Even as they gnaw their tongues in anguish, they curse the God of heaven for their pain and their sore. The same attitude seems to be present in the members of the Sanhedrin. They have been turned over to their sin. Their hearts are hardened. They are stiff-necked. And they have been given over to uncontrollable blind anger. And just as Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount, unchecked anger culminates in murder. They were enraged. And they were grinding their teeth. But Stephen had a completely different posture, didn't he? He was at peace. You know, Luke tells us more than once that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 6, at the choosing of the seven, the apostles told the church to pick out seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom. And Stephen is, list, Stephen is listed, listed first among those who are chosen. And Luke again tells us that he is full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And then he says they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking as he debated with those in the synagogue. And then he is said to be full of grace and power in Acts chapter 6, verse 8. In the, end of Acts, in the end of Acts 6, we are told that his face was like the face of an angel. The dignified members of the Sanhedrin are filled with rage and are losing their ability to control themselves. But Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit and full of grace, and he is at peace. He looks up into heaven, he gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He says, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen saw what we all long to see, the heavens opened up in the glory of God and our Savior, our Redeemer, standing at the right hand of God. Our eyes have not yet seen anything so great and so glorious because nothing on earth can compare to this beauty, the beauty of this vision. Now it's interesting that Jesus, not too long ago, stood before the same Sanhedrin on trial himself. And the high priest put Jesus under oath and he said, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus responded and said, you have said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Stephen used the same designation that Jesus uh, chose to use for himself often, son of man. Uh, he describes Jesus as the son of man, not setting, but standing at the right hand of God. Now you know this title, son of man, is a messianic title from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, which says this, I saw in the night vision, and behold, the clouds of heaven, uh, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before them. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. The context here shows the sovereignty of the Son of Man over all people and over all nations and His kingdom as supreme over all nations and all kingdoms. And He will execute His righteous judgment on all kingdoms 
of this world and on all those who reject the glorious gospel of his kingdom. Now it's interesting that Stephen sees this vision, but he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. We see all the other references to Jesus' exaltation. He's seated at the right hand of God. And it's kind of understood, generally understood, that that is uh, meant to communicate that his work is done. The work of redemption is done. It's complete. So he sits by the Father. So why does Jesus, uh, why does Stephen see Jesus standing next to the Father? Well, we don't know for sure because we are not told. But it probably means that he is standing ready to vindicate Stephen and standing ready to enact judgment against the Sanhedrin. The rage-filled rejection of Stephen's message will meet the judgment of God, and he stands ready to deliver that judgment. Listen to me, and I say this with complete sobriety and seriousness. If you are rejecting the good news of the gospel, then you are rejecting the sovereign Son of Man, the only way of salvation. And without the grace of the gospel, there is only terrifying, awful judgment. And there is no escape clause. There is no lever you can pull to shoot out and have a different route. There is only one way of salvation. And if you don't repent and believe the gospel, you will spend eternity in a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. There is nothing more serious or more urgent. If you've not believed upon his name, you must do it with all urgency. Judgment is an absolute necessity because God is infinitely holy and humanity is sinful and wretched before him. And there is salvation in no other place. But also, as I thought about this throughout the week, Jesus standing and revealing himself in this way to the first martyr, I think that it shows his keen interest in the suffering of his saints. I remember many years ago when our children were much smaller and nicer, uh, we used to go to this museum in Raleigh, North Carolina. This was during my seminary days, and there was a, there was a free museum in Raleigh, so we took advantage of that because we didn't have any money. Uh, it was, I believe it was called the Marbles Museum, um, and it was basically a huge playpen for children. There were different floors and different levels, and there were just tons of different activities and things that children can do, and it was just, you know, Disneyland for kids, so to speak. Um, and we would take our little children who were toddlers at the time and just let them run around from station to station, and they would play as they went. And I would kind of anxiously follow them around because there were a lot of older kids, a lot of older kids that were not toddlers who would run and sprint. They were big kids. And I felt the need to protect my little wobbly toddlers, so I would stand guard over my children um, to make sure they didn't get knocked over. And I, I actually became a little bit too overprotective because at times I wanted to give a stiff arm to a little kid. I didn't, I didn't do that, but I, I, the thought crossed my mind a couple of times. But I had a heightened awareness. I had a laser focus on my kids because I didn't want them to get hurt. I didn't want them to get run over. I wanted to defend and protect them. I was alert and on guard. Maybe something similar is happening, happening here with Jesus standing. He's keenly aware of the unrighteous suffering that his people have to endure. And he stands. He inclines himself to us when we are persecuted for his name's sake. Now that does not mean that he's going to intervene and stiff arm the persecutor all the time. He has purposes way beyond what we could possibly understand. And it may give him the most glory for you to suffer. It may give, you, give him the most glory for you to be ridiculed and mocked because you love Jesus. And that may be his plan. And we just have to trust that his purposes are far beyond what we can perceive. Now, I hope that none of us in this room will become martyrs. 
So you can be sure that if we're going to desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, we will be persecuted. Some of you are being persecuted in one way or another. This is normal Christianity. As you face persecution and ridicule and mocking, in whatever way, it, whatever form it comes to you, you can have confidence that the sovereign Son of Man, whose kingdom is greater than all other kingdoms, you can be sure that He sees your suffering and He will vindicate you and He will bless you and reward you, whether in this life or the next. He sees it all and He stands when his people suffer. Now, one other thing I want to notice here is the contrast in what we've said about heaven and hell or what this text teaches us. Hell is a place of unspeakable horror and pain, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, pain and anger and rage and, and, and sin unleashed. Sin will have its way to the fullest and nothing will slow it down or hinder its will. People will be completely dominated and ruled by it in that place, even as they suffer its judgment. But in contrast, heaven, heaven is a place where the sovereign of the universe looks upon our affliction and stands when he sees us suffer for the sake of his name. Stephen received a warm welcome to the throne of God, to the glory of God. And everyone who believes upon Christ, like Stephen, will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. There will be no more pain, no more crying, no more suffering or affliction. The presence of sin will be completely eradicated from our hearts and our minds, and nothing will hinder us from basking in the joy of the Lord for all eternity. We will delight in the Lord every second of every day for billions upon billions of years, and it will never get old. We will never get tired. We will never get bored. We will have increasing joy into the ages, forever and ever. When Stephen communicates this vision to the Sanhedrin and tells them that he sees Jesus alive and well, resurrected and ascended to heaven's throne and standing at the right hand of God, it's just too much for the Sanhedrin. It's like the dam burst open and the floodwaters of their rage are released. This type of rage is not reasonable, it's not controlled, it's not dignified, it's blind rage. These men who are dressed to the nine with their religious garb and their robes and all their stuff cried out with a loud voice and shut their ears and rushed at him all together with unity. They rushed at him to put him to death. And they rushed at him with violent intentions. They're acting like petulant children who don't get their way. Even worse, murderous people. They drove him out of the city and stoned him with stone. Luke tells us they, they took off their garb. They took off their garments. Probably so that they could throw with better velocity and freedom. And they threw stones at him one by one until he turned into a bloody pulp of a man. Luke tells us as they took off their garments, they, they laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. And we know that this is Paul. We'll talk about him more in a moment. But before Stephen died, as they're throwing stones at him, as stones are flying at him and bursting his skin open, he called out to God and said, Jesus uh, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, just as Christ cried out from the cross, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. But then he also prays for the people who are putting to death, just like Jesus did. He cried out with a loud voice, Father, do not hold this sin against them. As the blunt force of those stones are breaking bones and bursting his skin and bruising his body. He's not bitter. He's not angry. He has no rage against the mob attack. He's not pulling out his phone to record the attack in pursuit of justice or the thrill of going viral. That was a joke because he didn't have a phone. He's not defending himself 
against the charges of blasphemy. He's being condemned as a blasphemer. He's not defending himself. He's not crying out foul or sulking in self-pity. He's not crying out, woe is me. He's not looking for rescue or vengeance. Instead, he prays for his persecutor, just like Jesus did from the dead. Earlier this week, I suffered a personal injustice that was leveled against me. And it was, it was tough. I was pulling out onto the highway, Donna Ross, and the guy behind me started honking at me because I didn't go fast enough. Can you believe that? I, do you know who I am? You know? And I just couldn't believe it. Why would this guy do something so cruel? And as I finally pulled into traffic and drove away, I, I started, my mind started to think of all the things I'd like to do to that guy. Or all the things that I should have done. You know, what I should have done is just sit there at the stop sign or at the red light and just not move for a long, awkward 15 minutes. And then just let him keep blowing the horn. And then I would just laugh my night at him. You're going to sit here with me, buddy. Or I thought maybe, you know, in the gap, I, I would just wait for the gap of traffic and pull out last minute so I can pull out and then he can't. My mind was thinking of all these wicked things that I wanted to do to this guy because of the injustice of him lightly tooting his horn one time at me. And I had to remind myself of how silly that is. And I also had to remind myself that I'm a pastor. And if I would have done all those things, that guy might be sitting in our church this morning looking at me like, that's that maniac <laughs> from the highway. So I reminded myself of those things. And simply by the grace of God, I didn't do anything foolish. I just drove away. Now, that's a silly example. But to be prepared for persecution, we have to be completely ready to leave vengeance to the Lord. We have to be prepared to be mistreated, to be maligned, to be spoken about falsely, to be lied about, to be reviled, and maybe even to be martyred. And in the midst of all of that, we have to remember that we are called to love our enemies and not seek retaliation. Jesus stands when his people are persecuted. He stands when Stephen is put to death. We don't need to defend ourselves. We don't need to become activists. We can put our trust in him. And we can even seek the salvation of those who are rage-filled at us and want our destruction. After he prayed for the mob of persecutors, Luke tells us that he fell asleep. Kind of a strange time for a nap, but now obviously that's a euphemism for death. It's a euphemism in many different languages and cultures uh, that sleep is a metaphor for death. But it's a fitting metaphor for Christians. The same word was used of Lazarus when Jesus said, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I go to awaken him. And Jesus went and raised him from the dead. Falling asleep is a fitting metaphor because in the death of a believer, death does not have the end because we have been given eternal life. We have been raised to life. We will be raised to life at the resurrection with a new body that is incorruptible. Death does not have the final say over you, O oh believer. Death cannot conquer us. Death cannot have dominion over us. Christ took our death in his death. It cannot separate us from the love of Christ. And even as we face physical death, we can know that he is there with us in the valley of death. Saul was the young man who stood by the garments of those who killed Stephen. Luke tells us in chapter 8 that he approved of this execution. And on that day, the church was scattered. All except the apostles. And the death of Stephen sparked a great persecution. Now, of course, we know that the scattering of Christians, 
brings with it a scattering of the gospel. Because with the Christian goes the gospel. So as they are scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, the gospel goes with them. And just like the scattering of seed, the gospel bears fruit. In fact, the word here for scattering has within it the word for seed. So there's a great irony there that as they are scattered, the seed of the word of God is scattered. This was God's plan to spread the word of God, to spread the gospel. And the gospel bears fruit. Saul, who is Paul, is really presented here in the first few verses of chapter 8 as the chief persecutor of the church. He was ravaging the church. He was going house to house, interrupting their gatherings to drag men and women off to prison. Later we are told in Acts chapter 9 that he was breathing threats and murder against the disciples. Paul would later say of himself in 1 Timothy that he was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, calls himself the foremost sinner. And in Galatians 1.13, Paul says, I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. The rage and hate and anger and grinding of teeth and the murderous persecution that happened is Paul's life. He has devoted himself to these things. He loathes Christ and he loathes the church of Christ. Now, if it were not for the grace of God, the grace of God that's greater than all our sins, if it were not for that grace, then Paul would have stayed that way. And if it were not for the grace of God in our lives, then we would be this way too. So let us not look upon Saul or the Sanhedrin as if we are somehow better. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. Uh, John says the wrath of God abides on those who do not believe. Serious stuff that we're talking about here. If it were not for God's grace intervening in our lives, we would be far worse than you could possibly imagine. We would be, without Christ, dead in our trespasses and sin, sons of disobedience, children of wrath. Without hope, without salvation, but for the grace. Saul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and was gloriously converted. He was born again. He believed in the resurrected Lord. He believed that Jesus died for our sins on Calvary's cross and that righteousness is not something that comes from our ethnicity. It is not something that comes from our religious pedigree. It is not something that can come from religious rituals that we may perform in our own strength and our own works. Righteousness is not something that comes from our obedience to the law. Paul will say later of all his accomplishments that they are rubbish and that nothing compares to the greatness of knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. Paul found a righteousness that comes from Christ by faith. This is the beauty of the gospel. He takes all of our liabilities on himself. He takes all of our sin upon himself and he paid it in full. There's nothing you can do to atone for your sin. There's only one atonement. It's through Christ. He took all our sin and paid for it in full. And then for those who believe, He extends to them. He imputes His righteousness. It's the only way to be saved. He, he grants His righteousness as a free gift. Paul was completely shattered by the grace of God. And then the grace of God put him back together. And if you think about it, that's that's us, isn't it? That's who we are. God's grace keeps breaking us down. If you're a Christian, God's grace keeps breaking us down and rebuilding us. God's grace keeps exposing our sin and then helping us put it to death. Oh, but for the grace of God, who would we be? Where would we be? Only the grace of God can take a murderous persecutor of the church and turn him into the greatest missionary of the church. What marvelous grace. He flips the world upside down. 
Now, when we read stories like Stephen, we read stories about the persecuted church, those who have been put to death. We read about their courage and their boldness and their fearlessness in the midst of such terrible suffering. We read about the terrible Roman persecutions in those first few centuries, how they put Christians to death and threw them to the wild beasts to entertain the masses. We read about all those things and such courage and boldness that they had and such resolve to stand in the face. We can very easily get discouraged and start to think, I, I mean, I'm a train wreck when someone says they don't like me on Facebook. Listen, when we read all those stories, when we read about Stephen, Luke is not highlighting Stephen nor Paul as super soldier followers of Christ, as if they had some sort of resources that are unavailable to us, as if they had some sort of superpower at the Christian life that we cannot ever attain. They were men just like us. There were people just like us. What we're highlighting here in these verses, what Luke is highlighting for us, is not so much their courage, although they prayed for boldness and all of that kind of thing. It's God supplying the need. It's God giving them everything that they need for life and godliness. It's them being full of the Holy Spirit, enabled by grace, empowered by the Holy Spirit, trusting God at His word, now, I think as we think about persecution that maybe some of you are going through now or the possibility of facing it in the future, I think we need to remember um, that they were just like us and that we have the same resources available to us. We can walk closely with the Spirit. We can walk in obedience to His Word. We've been given everything that we have that we need for life and godliness. We have the Spirit. We have the Word. We have the Church. And also, we can trust that he will equip us to endure suffering for the sake of his name, no matter what may come. And we can hold fast to the truth that death has lost its sting. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your faithfulness and your grace and your mercy. We thank you that you saw fit to make the gospel known to us. And Father, I pray that together we would cling to this truth and that we would, we would help each other along the way. We thank you that your grace tears us down and builds us up. We're grateful that, that the gospel was not quenched by persecution throughout the ages, but that you caused the, the gospel to bear much fruit, even as the enemy sought to put it to death. Father, I do pray if there's anyone in this room who's not believed upon the name of Christ or anyone who is taking the seriousness of this uh, too lightly, God, that you would, you would shake them by your spirit and that you would show them, open their eyes, Lord, to see the importance of this issue. Father, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name.